Welcome to this lecture, which is called Martinus, His Life and Works. I was asked to give this lecture because this year is the 100th anniversary of Martinus's world picture. It's 100 years since Martinus had the profound spiritual experience on the 24th of March, 1921, that en enabled him to uh, understand, to see all the laws, of, laws and principles of life, and enabled him to write uh, his large amount of works and draw his symbols and give his lectures. He presented what he called the eternal world picture. We don't usually talk so much about the man himself, but on this occasion we thought it was perhaps um, appropriate. So, and I need a pointer. So, let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. This is the earliest photograph we have of Martinus. He was 11 years old. This was a school photo. Martinus was born on the 11th of August, uh, 1890, in Sindale, in Vensusel, which is in the, the north of Jutland. His mother was Else Christina Mikkelsen, and his father was unknown. But Martinus himself believed that he was his mother's employer, uh, an estate owner called Lars Larsen. He owned a large farm. Uh, in, uh, in, the, in the area. So, so Martinus was born out of wedlock. He was a so-called illegitimate child. This is his mother, taken in 1897. She had three other children, older than him. But um, she, if, I don't know for what reason, but she couldn't have Martinus with her at the farm where she worked. So um, she fostered him out, her brother and his wife took him, so he was a brought, brought up um, with foster parents. <coughs> this is Martinus in 1961 in Sindale. Here he's at the grave of Lars Larsen. Uh, this is a man who Martinus presumed was his father. He, he, was, um, he, he owned the estate called Christian's Hill, and later it was known as Christian's Minne. It gets a bit confusing when you read about these things because they're the same place. But a stable hand called Michael Thompson was um, paid to, to, um, uh, to, be the far, to be named as Martinus's father. So that's where the Thompson comes from. Martinus's surname was Thompson but he dropped it um, as a writer. He didn't use his surname as a writer. <coughs> uh, this is a, a picture of Martinus doing military service in the Danish Navy. Mostly Martinus worked as a dairyman. He worked in various uh, dairies uh, throughout Jutland and um, even on Fuhn, uh, Funen, and then the he was called up like many young men, and we think this picture is from 1913. And he, he went into the, the Navy, and he worked on a, uh, a boat called the Walross, I think, the um, <coughs> And um, he was given the job of stoker. That means he had to stoke the, he had to put coal into the engines, a very heavy job. And he was used to a very clean job with white clothes on in a dairy. And now he was suddenly covered in soot from top to toe. And it was a very heavy job. And he was a bit of a weakling physically. He was really not very strong. Um, and um, someone took pity on, on him and said, ah, this is maybe not the right job for you. And he, we'll find something else for you. So he became a kind of manservant for, for one of the officers. So he made his bed and di did different lighter duties. But he said that if he had been asked to shoot, uh, he would have shot directly up in the air. He, it would be, have been impossible to aim a gun at anybody. So, um, but that never happened. Uh, Martinus, as a young man, had a lot of artistic talents. 
He was, he was very good at painting, and uh, I believe we're going to have an exhibition here at the weekend, and I believe we will see some of his paintings. Um, and um, he painted sort of um, landscapes and animals, and um, yeah, rather simple motifs. And he was rather good at woodwork. He was good at um, uh, cutting, cutting into woods, and there's a nice little bookshelf thing he made. And he he liked taking photos. And unlike um, the other young men of his generation, he wasn't the least interested in finding a female partner. So when they were out trying to find a girl, he went out trying to take photos. <laughs> so. Um, uh, he, d he didn't share their interests at all. But these artistic hobbies um, served him well later on when he came to draw his symbols and make his slides. Uh, he did, did all, uh, all that work himself. In the beginning, he painted his slides on glass uh, plates with a brush that was one hair wide. <laughs> so. Um, uh, and you can see some of those symbols in, in the, the posthumous symbol books. So these artistic talents served him well later on. Now we get to the, 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 the more important part of his life, where um, he moved to Copenhagen, and he got a job in this dairy, Enighedden in Nørrebro, North Bridge, part of Copenhagen. And he worked there as an office clerk. He was used to working in the dairy, making butter and cheese, and was rather well known for having improved the quality of the, the products. So he was very popular. He was very popular too, because he was very good at solving conflicts between employers and staff, or between the staff. Or, and people found him a very, very pleasant person to have around. While he was working at this dairy, <coughs> he met a, another young man who was reading a book. And uh, he told Martinez about this book. Uh, it was a theosophical book, as far as we understand. And it, um, it mentioned something about my meditation. And, um, but the young man had borrowed the book from a man called Lars Nibelwang. So he couldn't just lend it to Martinez. He, uh, he asked Lars Nibelwang if he could lend it to Martinus, but Lars Nibelwang said, uh, yes, but, but have him come and visit me first, uh, and, then, uh, and then we'll see about it. So Martinus went out to visit Lars Nibelwang. Lars, Lars Nibelwang was a, a flautist in Tivoli Promenade Orchestra, a, a little orchestra, one of the smaller orchestras in Tivoli Gardens in Copenhagen. Um, but... Uh, uh, his main interest uh, was uh, esoteric wisdom and the occult. He, he had read more or less what there is to know about esotericism. So he was a, an enormous fount of esoteric wisdom. Um, <coughs> anyway, Martinez went out to, to um, Lars Nibelwang and asked if he could borrow the book. Uh, but he first asked if, if these new... Uh, spiritual movements that were coming forward, if they had anything to do with prayer, prayer to God. And um, uh, he was told, yes, they were. And if, if the answer had been no, not at all, then um, he, he wouldn't have been interested. But since the answer was affirmative, then he decided, um, yeah, he would borrow this book. He didn't get to read very much of it. Uh, yeah, just... This is Martinus here at the dairy. Uh, in 1920. So this is the year before this experience took place. And this is Lars Nibelwang, who Martinus borrowed the book from. This is Martinus's famous wicker chair, which you'll all also be able to see at the weekend. Um, the book said or suggested that you could sit yourself down and put a blindfold on your eyes and um, meditate on the idea of God. And Martinus started to do this, and suddenly he saw, let's see if I have it here, yes, he saw this statue of 
of Christ by Bertel Thorvaldsen. The Danes here know that this is a very famous statue. It's in the um, cathedral in Copenhagen, the Church of Our Lady. Uh, not only that, but the smaller copies of it are in very many churches in Denmark, and I've even seen it in Greenland. And many people had small copies in their homes, so I more or less see, say that nearly all Danes knew this figure. Um, anyway, Martinus started to meditate on the idea of God, and then this figure appeared, a plaster figure of Christ, and it came towards him and towards him. And then it became dark, and then it, it became light again, and then this um, figure... <laughs> Then this figure turned, uh, it, it, Martinus describes the clothes Christ was wearing as being made of diamonds with blue shadows. Very, very beautiful, shining and alive, not just a, a stiff pla uh, plaster figure. And this, this figure came towards him and came towards him and got bigger and bigger so that the feet went through the floor and the, the head went through the ceiling. It became absolutely enormous and then it went right inside him. And it stood there and had remained there the rest of his life, he said. And from this Christ figure within him, this enormous beam of light went out through the universe. Um, and um, in this beam of light, it's, it's actually rather hard to describe because I haven't experienced it myself. And Martinez's description is so beautiful, uh, so I can't do it justice. So I would recommend that in English you, you can read about it in the little book on the birth of my mission. And in the, first, in the preface to leave its book, The Book of Life, Volume 1. But um, anyway, from this, in this beam of light, he saw the, the planet, he saw the earth rotating, uh, he saw all the laws and principles of life. He experienced being one with God. And this was a fantastic experience. He describes this as the um, white baptism of fire. And he reached a point where he felt his consciousness would just burst and had to sort of shut down the experience. But nevertheless, he, the next day, he, he thought he would, he would try again. And... Uh, he got a, a one, got a wonderful experience of what he called golden threads or golden filaments. Uh, another experience of that God is in everything and everyone. Um, and these experiences uh, left him with these. Um, this is a short summary of some of the things he experienced. He experienced that he was totally immortal. He could never die. We can lose our physical form and get another form. We can return to physical form, but we can never die. So not only he, not, it wasn't only him who couldn't die. No one could die in the absolute sense. Of course, we can lose this physical life, but we, we return. And in a way, it's very important to understand that we are not as we seem to be. We seem to have a certain height and weight and age and nationality and uh, gender and so on. But actually, we are eternal living beings. We have no beginning, no end. But it doesn't look like that. And Martinus could see through this, this um, illusion that this physical body is and realize that he was totally immortal. Not only he was totally immortal, but everybody and every animal, every plant is totally immortal. Every planet, every galaxy, every Milky Way, and so on. He also realized that the universe constitutes one living being. There is only one living being. There's nothing outside the universe. And this universe, Martinus uh, defines as God himself. There's nothing outside of God. We all live and move and have our being within God's organism and consciousness. And there's no one who's indispensable. Everyone has a role to play in this eternal, um, infinite organism and consciousness of God. This was a fantastic revelation 
there is only one living being. He saw that, uh, that evolution takes place within this one organism in order that we can experience life. There are more highly developed worlds and there are less developed worlds. There are more highly developed beings and less highly developed beings. We're all somewhere on this eternal continuum of evolution. And there's no judgment in that. Uh, it's just like saying she is two years old and he's 11 and she's 15 and so on. Uh, we all move through these worlds. <coughs> Another thing he saw that <coughs> is that what we classify as evil, what we call evil, <coughs> is only what he calls the unpleasant good. And that's a term I really love because um, it combines a temporal analysis. That is that it hurts here and now. It's unpleasant. Uh, if you break your toe, it's, you can't say it's pleasant. Um, I've tried it. <laughs> <laughs> Big toe in five pieces. It wasn't fun. Um, it's unpleasant. That's the here and now. The other aspect is um, the, the good that in an eternal perspective, it serves a purpose. I had something to learn from breaking my big toe. And, you know, life hurts in all sorts of ways. We have unhappy love, we have poverty, we have war, we have uh, sexual confusion, we have problems with the relationships, illnesses, you name it. So there's an awful lot of unpleasantness in this world. But Martinez manages to balance, balance empathy for the temporal state with seeing the eternal meaning behind the unpleasantness. So he, he says that um, when he says that everything is very good, he's not saying that everything is very pleasant. Some things are pleasant, some things are unpleasant, but they're all good. They all serve a divine purpose. He also saw that we, we can gain access to cosmic knowledge only by being sufficiently loving. If we can't love, the doors of knowledge are closed to us. We can't experience the highest wisdom if we're horrible. I mean, if we're nasty and critical and mean and greedy and selfish and vengeful and hate people and, yeah, you name it. It's a clo it closes the doors. So the only way you can gradually open those doors is to be loving. And one of the purposes of Martinez's works is to show us who our neighbor is. Christ said, love thy neighbor as thyself. But who is our neighbor? And how do we love them? And the, uh, the uh, humane religions have focused mainly on um, loving other human beings. Um, even though I once heard the Archbishop of Canterbury, he was sending the British troops to the Falklands, Falkland, Falkland Islands to fight the Argentinians. And he said, yeah, they say one should love one's neighbor as oneself. That's true enough. But there are some exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> and he sent them off to war. So that was a bit of a shock for me. Um, so not even Christianity, at least in his words, was covering all human beings. But Martinez shows that in order to, to be truly loving, you have to love all beings, all human beings, all animals, all plants. In other words, the mesocosmos. That's the, the part of the spiral cycle of evolution that we're on. You have to love all of them. And um, it's a longer lecture to talk about how one does that, but it, amongst other things, it means being very kind to the animals and not using them for food, or at least gradually, uh, gradually getting rid of meat eating. Um, and then he talks about loving one's microcosmos, that is to say one's organs, one's cells, one's particles, the whole inner universe within us, ourselves. And then to love our macrocosmos, which is the planet we live on. And we can do this by 
looking at the forms of energy we use, how much we pollute, and uh, a, a lot of the things that people are actually working on at the moment. Anyway, it's good to know, and it was very good for me uh, to be very clear that if I wanted to be totally initiated myself and get cosmic, get some sort of access to cosmic knowledge, that the only way was through love. It's a moral issue. It's a mor uh, cosmic knowledge is a moral issue. It's not a matter of some sort of special technique. <coughs> he also experienced that he became his own source of absolutely unlimited knowledge. So he, he experienced that um, whatever question he had about life, he got the answer. The answer appeared within his own consciousness. Um, he saw the spiritual laws and principles behind the physical world. He be became conscious in the life of the whole universe. So, um, at the same time, in, this, in the preface to Levi's Bow 1, the Book of Life, Volume 1, he talks, about, he talks about all these things and says that he, uh, during this experience, he became one with God. And that he could see all these spiritual laws and principles behind the physical universe. And you could think, well... He's, he thinks very highly of himself. <laughs> but then at the end of the preface, he says that he's not one jot better. Jot, that's tull in Danish. He's not one jot better than anybody else. Because if you haven't already been there before him, you will get there after him. It's just like reaching a certain age. Evolution will take us there. So uh, this is... I, I guess most of us haven't been there already since we have, <laughs> since we have to study this. <laughs> so um, this is what we have to look forward to. We will, we will reach a moral standard that will open the doors of wisdom to us and make it possible for us to have a direct experience of all knowledge, nothing less. And we will become, become conscious that the whole universe is alive and it's God that we meet in every living being. Not bad. So, uh, Martinus got the idea that he should um, draw some symbols. And this is, this is his original sketchbook from 1924. Here it says uh, in, on the, f the first page, a study for the production of Levi's book, the Book of Life, in pictures. And we can see in this book uh, a number of symbols. Uh, all of them but one are declared invalid. It says invalid on the bottom of them. It took him a while to find his symbolic language. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and what we saw was that um, if you see some of these symbols, you can see them uh, among other places in Pierre Bruce Jensen's book, Sol or Moon, or Sun and Moon. Um, he saw that um, he, he placed the energies of um, instinct, gravity, feeling, intelligence, instinct, and memory. He placed them all on a line with the, uh, the mother energy. But then he found out that the mother energy had a special role, and that the other so-called basic energies, these energies here, here we have memory, instinct, gravity, feeling, intelligence, intuition, that they are, are all... Um, almost like organs in the mother energy. The mother energy is the mother of all the energies, so to speak. And uh, when, he, when he found out that this is how they were organized, he, he says in his memoirs, and when they, he means the, the basic energies, and when they were in their right place and everything was balanced out, I felt the support of the entire spiritual world. I felt such indescribable joy and bliss flowing through me, and I realized 
it was a solution to the whole mystery. So from then on, he, he went on to draw 100 symbols exactly, all of which are now published. We published many of them posthumously in symbol books number four, five, and six. Um, we don't have volumes five and six in English yet. So his main work is Leave It's Book, The Book of Life. The title in itself is an analogy. It's, uh, it has many meanings in a, in a sense because it's a book about life. It tells us how life is constructed, what life is. It also, also helps us to read life itself like a book. So when we experience life, we're reading the real book of life, not the theoretical book. One of my friends who um, couldn't be here uh, this week um, is having to take care of someone who's not well. And uh, she, I said, yeah, you're reading the real book of life. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we are reading the real book of life all the time. <clears throat> and here we have it, seven volumes, about 3,000 pages. In English, we have volumes one to five, they're published. I'm working on translating volume six, and I intend to translate volume seven. So we're on our way. And this immersed between the years 1932 to 1960, Volume 1 came out in 32, uh, and yeah, there's a long story about the publication of that, but I think I'll skip that. Um, here we see Martinus with one of his volumes. So the seven volumes, they, um, the first volume is a kind of introduction to his world picture. There's a lot about the future of human society in Volume 1. There's a lot about evolution. Volumes two and three are, um, for me, the most complicated analyses of what he calls cosmic chemistry, about how all our thoughts and actions um, work, and how they return to us and affect our, our fate. Um, and I always think if you can get through volume two and three, then the rest is easy going. Uh, <laughs> and then... Um, uh, yeah, and volume three ends with this, for me, glorious analysis of the number system. But I'm a bit nerdy about that. So, <laughs> and, and then volume four um, is basically about, well, it's mostly about sexuality, but there's quite a lot about Adam and Eve and evolution in it. Quite a lot about society and crime and punishment. But uh, halfway through, he starts talking about Adam and Eve, and he con continues into volume five, which is uh, the whole story of human sexual evolution. And the day I, I finished, the, the day it was published in English, I flew to San Francisco to present the book at a, a conference on sexuality. So that was, that was rather nice. <coughs> um, San Jose, rather. I flew to San Francisco. Um, yeah, and then volume six, for me, it's the, the top point, the, the highest, the culmination of Levis Bow, because here Martinus takes the, um, yeah, he quotes God for about 100 pages. I mean, <laughs> who else, who, el <laughs> who else does that? <laughs> um, but you really feel that he has experienced this. And um, what he does is he takes this returning prodigal son who's been down in the darkness, been eating with the swine. In other words, been in, in the darkness where we kill and we're greedy and we're selfish and vengeful and all those things where we hate and kill and so on. We've been there. And we have learned the lessons of it, and we want, to, we want nothing more than to return to the Father, so to speak, to return to being one with God. And there's this glorious description of how um, God initiates the returning living being into the mesocosmos and into the microcosmos and the macrocosmos. So it describes this threefold initiation. So for, for me, it's the most elevated thing I've ever read. And it's 
an absolute joy to translate it because I sit there feeling ecstatic. <laughs> and then volume seven is about the cosmic world morality, and it's more or less a summary of the moral consequences of this world picture. That's just <laughs> leave his book in a few words, and of course, 3,000 pages, uh, there he uses many, many more words than I do. So, so in 1960, Levis Boy 7 was completed and published, and then Martinus went on holiday. He, he, his friends, uh, Sam Singlerson and Peter Zako, they had long wanted to take Martinus on a holiday, and he said, no, I can't do it until I've finished working on Levis Boat. So once Levis Boat was, was finished, uh, they went on a trip, to Egypt, Jordan, Israel, Greece, and Rome. So here we have them in Athens at the Acropolis. Uh, Matthias always had a camera. He was a keen photographer all, all through his life. Here he also has a camera at the um, pyramids and the Sphinx in Egypt. And here, here he talked about the pyramids being much, much older than we reckon. He talked about 80 to 90,000 years old. And the Sphinx, of course, was a very important symbol for Martinez because it's a, it's a symbol of our mental condition now. We are partly animal and we are partly human. And we are progressing in the direction of becoming completely human. But we're not all there yet. Then, um, Leosbo I came out in 32. In 1933, Martinez decided to publish a magazine, Cosmos. This is the first issue of Cosmos. And um, he starts with this, uh, for me, absolutely glorious uh, beginning where he sort of uh, pronounces that God speaks to people through all things, pleasant and unpleasant. God's voice is everything that can be sensed, thought, or experienced. Uh, and that the more that you learn to understand the, div the direct speech of life. That's one of Martinus's favorite phrases, the, direct, that God, the universe is talking to us, God is talking to us. The more we learn to understand the, that the universe is talking to us, then the more we will gradually come to see that everything is very good, albeit not always very pleasant. So if you want a bit of cheering up, I recommend you to read the beginning of Cosmos number one is quite a, it's like starting a symphony with a big blast of the trumpets, da da. <laughs> so, and then this is a current uh, edition of Cosmos with a new layout and uh, uh, new photographs. We have a, a photographer who helps us. Um, and then in 1967, Things became, began to become more international. Uh, Cosmos was published in Sweden, in Swedish. In Dan it was published in Swedish in Denmark. And then the English edition of Cosmos uh, evolved. It started as contact letters that were first sent out on the 16th of January, 1959. Uh, the Institute stopped sending them out in 65 because there were too few subscribers. But in 1971, uh, they set up something called News from the Martinez Institute, uh, and that carried on until 77. I I've myself first read Martinez in 1974, so I remember getting these news from the Martinez <coughs> Institute, and it was always very exciting. There was always a, a Martinez article inclu included. And then from 1978 until the present day, Cosmos has been published in English. Now it's available as an online magazine. It's a bit too expensive for us to publish it as a paper magazine because the, the subscribe, uh, subscription numbers are still rather small. But we have this quite substantial magazine in English. And, and um, yeah, I could, if you see this homepage here, cosmosmagazine.net, you could go in there and find the Danish, the Swedish, and all the foreign editions. The German edition of Cosmos started in um, April 1968, 
and it was a continuation of the German contact letters that had been published since, since September 1960. And then Esperanto was first published in March 1995. This is the latest edition celebrating 100 years for Martinez cosmology. And we have a Spanish edition that's also published online that started in 2014. And we have a Dutch edition. The difference about the Dutch edition is that it's produced in Holland. And we have some of the people here who are involved in it. Um, it's published by the, by the Martinus Center in The Hague in cooperation with the Institute. And uh, here we have the, the Dutch edition and the Dutch homepage if you want to find it. So, then uh, we come to the Martinus Center where we are now. Um, in 1934, Martinus um, expressed a wish for a place where people could gather in the summer to combine having a holiday with studying his analyses. People wanted to get out of the cities and um, they didn't go to lectures in the, in the city in the, in the um, summer. So someone uh, showed Martinez an ad for, the, for this area of land up here, which was more or less empty. And it was very, very cheap. Uh, and Martinez board, I can't remember exactly how much it was. It was very little. Uh, and bought this land here, and they started building the first houses. I'm afraid we're still using these houses from 1934, but <laughs> when we get the money, we'll buy something better. We'll build something better. So people spent a lot of their free time building this place up. And then in 1936, Martinez inaugurated the flag here. And it was a very windy, cold, wet um, spring day, more like November than April. Um, but he said it was uh, rather symbolic that this flag, which he called the greatest symbol of life, no less, should be um, flown for the first time on such a dark day, because it's when the darkness is greatest that the help is really needed. And here we see another picture where the well has cleared up a bit. And here we see it today. And um, Martinus described this flag as a symbol of God or the universe. <coughs> he uh, says that the triangle in the middle symbolizes the eye of the universe or God. The uh, violet circle here is the God's creative power and power to experience. And um, the star cross is God's manifestation and consciousness. At the same time, we see behind the star cross, we see the six basic energies that make up uh, existence. We see memory, instinct, gravity, feeling, uh, intelligence, intuition, and memory again. This shows that there's a cycle, that life goes on eternally, it's never ending. But that all of life, the entire universe, is made up of various combinations of these six basic energies. So he says it's, a, a uh, he says it's the greatest symbol of life that exists. And that um, flying this flag in one's heart, uh, yeah, that would... Um, it would be impossible if one was going to war or something. So, um, <coughs> I'll just just take a drink. So. Clint has evolved over the years. In July 1968, an English week was held for the first time. Uh, originally, this place was called, called Cosmos Holiday Center. It, wasn't, uh, he, it, it changed its name as, at the end of the 70s. 
a Martinus decided it should be called the Martinus Center. He sh thought his name should be on it, so to speak. He also thought it would be easier to find in a phone book if his name was on it. <laughs> um, and then uh, in, in July 69, uh, we had the first German week and the first Esperanto week. Esperanto was important for Martinus. He believed that um, the world would get a world language at some point, that not that the national languages would disappear, but the world, uh, we would need a world language if we were going to communicate on, the, on an equal footing. And when I came here for the first time in 1978 to the, to the one English week, <laughs> and it was full of Swedes because uh, <laughs> there, was no, um, there was no teaching in Swedish then. Well, I could say the teaching in Swedish here has uh, developed enormously over the years. So. In 1945, Martinez bought Clint's Gore, which is a big building over there, which is now a sports high school. Um, but it proved too expensive to run, and um, uh, they sold it again eight, eight years la later. It became a convalescent home for people who'd been in hospital and weren't well enough to go home, but um, needed to recover needed some care. Uh, but when, when the, the institute sold Clint's Gore, they kept a lot of the, the land. So the land we're standing on now was part of Clint's Gore's land. So where the lecture hall is and the, and the red pavilions here, the red pavilions were Clint's Gore's old hen houses. So the study rooms over there, they're in the old hen houses. Uh, and the pavilion B is, is, the old, is also a hen house. Uh, and then we built um, Pavilion A and Pavilion C. So all of that was Clint Segor's uh, land. So we kept some of the land but sold off the house. But he did predict that at some point we would get the, this house back. Um, for the moment, there isn't, it's not for sale. <laughs> but um, there isn't economy to buy it either. Um, but we have a very good cooperation with Clint Segor. They use our lecture hall in the winter. We are using two of their teaching rooms at the moment. Some summers we, we borrow a lot of bedrooms from them. So we have a very good relationship there. And here's the Martinus Institute in Copenhagen. Martinus had various offices in Copenhagen over the years. In 1943, he bought Marie in Delsvai, number 96 to 94 to 96. And this house is an administration and there are meeting rooms, which are also used as teaching rooms. So there are study groups throughout the whole winter season um, in Danish. There's a lecture hall, and it houses also the publishing house. Here we prepare the books and Cosmos for publication, and it also houses a bookshop. And uh, yeah, I, sh I forgot, it also houses Martinez's flat, like this. Um, with the blinds drawn. This is Martinus's flat. We keep the blinds drawn because we don't want things to fade. Martinus's flat is um, open as a museum, so if anyone wants to see it, it's a good idea to ring, idea to ring the institute and make an appointment, because not that people, many people come by, and we would like someone to be there to show you around. But you're welcome to visit Martinus's flat. So, Martinus traveled a little. He traveled to Japan and Iceland, Sweden and England. So let's see what happened. But there are also people who traveled to him. And I'd like to start with Paul Brunton. Many of the English speakers will know Paul Brunton rather well. He was a British journalist and author. He's most famous for his book In, In Search of Secret India. In Danish, it's called Be Indians Local Dør. Um, and he visited Martinus in 1950. He, um, Paul Brunton had a habit of traveling the world to meet the holy men, the wise men, the spiritual teachers, wherever they could be found. So somehow he heard about Martinus in Denmark. I don't know how. Um, Paul Brunton's first wife was Danish. Could, there could be something there. I don't know. Anyway, he met him in 1950, 
And then uh, in 1952, he came back and spent four months at the Institute with his new wife, a very young wife, uh, 19 years old she was, um, and he was much older. Um, and they spent four months living at the Institute where they received individual instruction from Martinez two to four nights a week with an interpreter, it was mostly Ingrid Ockels. And uh, Martinez uh, gave them a very thorough introduction to his world picture. And during this time, um, Paul Brunton made copious notes and uh, several hundred pages. And ha his plan was to write a book about Martinez. But all his notes got lost on his journey back to India. So uh, they've never been found. He did manage to write an article, which I'll come to in a minute. But he, he wrote here, Martinus is a man whom to know is to take into one's heart. He embodies the intelligence, the selflessness, and the love which constitute the essence of his moral and practical teaching. So, he, so Paul Brandon found no contrast between the man and his teaching. Uh, very often people are disappointed when they see that the, the man doesn't live up to the teaching, that maybe he seduces his disciples or whatever, you know, but here, um, here he found a, a good match. And we have a very um, active contact with the Paul Brunton Foundation, Philosophical Foundation in Boston today. Um, some months ago, they asked me to write a little article about the relationship between Brunton and Martinus. I was very limited in the amount of words, so this, it, I don't expect you to read this, but um, they were ge very generous and they linked to all our Martinus books in English on our homepage, all Martinus' articles on our homepage and his symbols with their explanations. And um, they linked to uh, the photos that we have of Paul Brunton and Martinus on our website. And they linked to our 100th anniversary edition of Cosmos. And they linked to this, uh, which is this long article that Paul Brunton wrote about Martinus which was intended to be a preface for the book Mankind and the World Picture. This was a little book in Danish called Menskeheden of Verdensbill. Um, Ingrid Ockels had made a, a rather provisional translation of it for Brunton because there was very little in English. Um, and Brunton wrote a summary, uh, wrote a, a summary of Martinus's teachings and uh, uh, intended to be a preface for this book. I must say, this book has not yet appeared in English because we haven't managed to retranslate it yet, but we will get round to it sooner or later. Anyway, this long art article can be found on paulbranton.org. Um, <clears throat> and Paul Branton returned to Martinus again in 1956. So, um, but it's interesting that today, the Paul Branton Philosophical Foundation is interested in this connection and interested in promoting Martinus on their own homepage. So in 1952, Martinus made his first journey to Iceland. This was the first of seven visits between 1952 and 1970. And he was invited by Greta Fels, who was the president of the Theosophical Society in Iceland. In Iceland, he, um, he was an enormous success. Hundreds came to his lectures. He, g he gave lectures to um, a synod of bishops and priests. Um, I mean, that wouldn't happen in Denmark. It's like, uh, I don't know how many, but uh, most of the, the Icelandic priests and bishops turned up to hear Martinus's view of Christ. Um, he was invited by the Icelandic president to come to tea. The, Icelandic president was very interested in spiritual matters and they had a very uh, pleasant afternoon together where the president asked him about all sorts of things. So he was a bit of a rock star in Iceland. <laughs> he kept uh, coming back, uh, going back and back. And uh, the institute intends to publish as soon as we can um, a book 
containing Martinus's letters from Iceland, from these uh, trips, and his correspondence with some of the, the people in Iceland. Uh, in Danish, sorry. But um, when this could happen, when Martinus could lecture so easily in, in Iceland, it was because he didn't need a translator, because uh, Iceland, is, Iceland was under Danish rule for a long time. Um, so Icelanders learned Danish in school and could understand and, re and read Danish. Um, he went to Japan in 1954. He was invited by an organization called Ananaya Kyo uh, to speak at the World Religions Con Congress in Shimizu City. So this is from Japan. And here we have Martinus. There was some story about his interpreter not turning up, but um, I, I don't know, I remember the exact details. So, and uh, on his way back from Japan, he went to India uh, at the invitation of Anna Ernsholt. Anna, Anna Ernsholt was a Dane. She was a secretary for President Nehru in India, very high position, but she was a very keen uh, uh, reader of Martinus's works. So Martinus gave a number of lectures in India, and, Marti and Anna Ernsthold interpreted them into English. And uh, personally, I feel a great debt of gratitude to Anna Ernsthold, because she made the first English translations. Um, the first book I read was The Road to Initiation in her translation, and it changed my life completely. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and interest in India grew, but Martinus uh, uh, couldn't allow himself time to repeatedly go to India, so he sent his secretary, uh, Gernal Larsen, who you see here. This is Eric Gernal Larsen uh, and Anna Ernsthold again. So Gernal Larsen went there uh, several, several times and had plans of building up a Martinus Institute in Delhi. It never came to anything. There, there were, um, but there were lots of people who attended his teaching and so on. When I took over the English Cosmos in, the, uh, in, the, in 1980, some years later, we, we sent so many uh, copies of the English Cosmos to India, um, none of them ever paid. And, um, that, that was okay if, if they actually still were alive and actually wanted it, but uh, I decided I would write to them all and see if they di did actually exist and if they still wanted the magazine. Only one replied, <laughs> and that was um, a library in, in uh, the Punjab. And they said they had regular study, study groups on Martinus and could we please continue sending the magazine and several copies if they if we could, and could, they send, could we send all the books? Because they, they had a little study group in, in uh, the Punjab. So that was funny, but it was like all of Eric Gerner Larsen's contacts had died out, more or less. <coughs> this is Centre House in London, where Martinez gave three lectures, uh, simultaneously, uh, well, no, consecutively translated by Benjamin Sachse. Um, in the 70s, I think it was 76, I heard Moens Müller give a lecture in exactly the same spot. I was a music student in London at the time. And in uh, uh, following on from those lectures in London, he went to a place called Unity House in Bone End, just outside London, for a weekend with Martinus. And some of you will know some of the people here this is um, Ismina Brist Bristow, who used to come to these international weeks. She's dead now, but um, at least her physical body is no longer with us. Uh, she was married to Alan Johnson, who was an Esperantist and found Martinus via Esperanto. Uh, this is Jeanne Day, or Jeanne Hawke, who translated the first volume of Leavis Boat with her husband, Axel Hawke. And this is Axel's daughter, Nina. Um, this is Susa Buch. Uh, this is Benjamin Sachse, who, who did the interpreting. This is Sam Singlerson. 
This is Peter Grimes, who's, who did the arranging. He arranged the lectures and this weekend. I don't, I don't know who all the others are. <coughs> but Peter Grimes turned up when I arranged lectures in Devon in the 80s. There was time for some sightseeing when Martinez was in England. He went to see Stonehenge and uh, declared that they were, the stones were put there by materialization, not by being mechanically moved. And again, we have his ever-present ever camera. Martinez had three illnesses during his life. In 1956, he had a stomach operation. He had just completed uh, giving the 15 lectures that are the basis for the book, the, gra uh, the Grand Course, Grand Courses. Um, and one of his friends who was a doctor thought he was looking terribly pale. And he, he also experienced that giving that course was rather strenuous for him. But then they found that, um, he, had, uh, that he had a very low um, blood levels. So his friend sent him... Uh, to be examined, and it ended up with he ended up having a stomach operation, um, and he felt like a new man after his stomach was bleeding. So, uh, uh, but he, he experienced his time in the hospital as a real holiday. He had visitors from morning to evening. He was full of energy. Uh, he was like a new man af after the operation, but it made him think about how he was spending his time, and he decided at that point to stop giving so many lectures and um, concentrate on finishing Leavis Bowl. And his two assistants, Mons Müller and Gerner Larsen, took over his lecture tours. In 1975, so he must have been 85 at that time, he had an operation on his prostata, and then after that he had a hernia. Hernia is brok in Danish. He had a, a hernia in the scar, which is very common. So. But he never, he never really suffered from being ill. He, he took these stays in the hospital as a, as a holiday. <laughs> um, yeah, I wish I could. <laughs> yeah. But uh, he wrote to Anna Ernsold about this operation. I have learned an enormous amount from going through an operation on my own body. My experiences at the hospital will make their mark on my forthcoming analysis of health in Levis Bow. Here, there will be analyses that I had not previously intended to make at all. In brief, the illness I have been through stands before me as an experience of light. Yeah, it would be nice if we all could say that, but uh, we will get there. And then we get to Martinez's um, last birthday celebration in Falconer's center in Copenhagen. Um, where Martinez is rather moved, and um, he knows his life on Earth is coming to an end. He dies some months after this. This is in the summer of um, uh, what well, must have been uh, eighty, and he died in March of eighty-one. Um, and he says here, <clears throat> "I'm not dead yet." <laughs> Uh, and even if I am dead, you can be assured that I am with you. And then he sort of swallows a bit, I am with you. Like, and it was easier for him to guide his cause, guide his work on this earth from the spiritual plane than the physical one. So he assured us, I, I am with you. Uh, he would follow his cause. Um, and this is his coffin in Frederiksberg Old Cemetery. Um, I took the photo. I kind of like it because here you see me in the window here with my winter hat on. Um, and when you translate Martinus, it's a li little bit like being a ghostwriter or uh, being a shadow of the, uh, the writer. Uh, you, you're certainly not the writer yourself. I, I kind of like it. Um, anyway, this is where Martinus's body is. Uh, Ole talked a lot this morning about um, how important it was for Martinus to take care of his microcosmos. And we're going to say that one of the first things he published in Cosmos in 1933 was um, a serialized version of the book, The Ideal Food, 
which had to do with the microcosmos. And the next one he wrote was called Bee Settles in Danish. It's not yet translated. We have a working title in English, which is On Funerals, which is a bit of a drastic title, maybe. But um, uh, there's a lot about looking after your body after death, but there's a lot about how your thinking affects your organism while you're alive. <coughs> and... Um, yeah, in order to take care of his microcosmos uh, and to demonstrate the importance of it, he had his body embalmed and he, lay his, he had his body laying in a zinc coffin uh, surrounded by a, a very heavy oak coffin so it could, um, it could survive. So even at the end, he was demonstrating, love your microcosmos. He wasn't doing this in order to be famous or so look at me even when I'm dead, but to say uh, this whole area of loving one's microcosmos is something very important. That was um, a quick run through Martinez's life and works. I think that's all for now. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.